they are part uh, uh, of the uh, desert tradition, first of all, because of the necessity uh, of catching food. A man with a good falcon can go on his camels or his horse and catch four or five birds, a uh, few rabbits, and feed the whole group and the whole clan. But also I want to say something, that when the um, game birds fly and you release that falcon after them, you feel that your heart have grown wings and flown. It gave the owner a feeling that he is flying. Travelling north from Mecca, the traders entered the most tightly controlled territory of their route. These deserts were ruled from an ancient city that was built into the rocks of the Hismar Mountains. It's easy to think that a journey through the Arabian Peninsula would be, well, quite boring, really, as far as landscapes are concerned anyway, that it would just be lots of flat desert and sand. But it's been incredibly varied, and I think this landscape really takes the prize. It's so beautiful. It's like a giant natural sculpture park. These are the ruins of Madin Sala. The people who lived here ensured the safe passage of the trade caravans in return for large taxes, which made them exceedingly wealthy. I think of all the places that I've visited so far along the incense trail, it's this one that offers the most tangible proof of just how influential those ancient trade routes were on the people living at the time. This plain here was once a vibrant city. It was established about 200 BC by a tribal group called the Nabataeans and their rise and fall almost exactly matches the height and decline of those overland trade routes. But as ever, it's not the houses of the living that tell the tale, but the houses of the dead. remains of the great city are 131 private tombs, each of them hand-carved out of solid rock. Built for the families of the city's elite, their elaborate facades stand testament to the great wealth that frankincense brought to the region. When archaeologists first started working here, this room was absolutely full of stands and none of these stone benches were visible. But it's believed that this was some sort of um, meeting house, somewhere that important members of the town would meet to discuss affairs of state or probably religious issues as well, because this entrance down here, which is staggering, this natural break in the rock, led to the most holy area of the city. And along the walls, you can see these little niches carved out, little places for the local deities. And there's centuries of inscriptions and graffiti, some in Aramaic, some in modern-day Arabic, charting the journeys that thousands and thousands of people must have taken through here. And just imagine, you've come on your caravan all the way from Oman, and all you want to do is thank your gods for your safe passage thus far and to pray that you'll be able to continue your journey unharmed and get lots of money for those precious goods that you were carrying. And what I love about this place is it may have been a religious centre for the Nabataeans, but they were incredibly democratic and they knew that the people that came here that had brought them their wealth would also want to worship their gods. So what they did here was the niche in the rock there, you can see is empty. And what they could do is bring their own little deities, put them in that niche and worship them, which is just, I think, the most lovely idea that anyone could come here and it would, it would be meaningful to them. And what a place to worship. This desert utopia came to an end at around 100 years after the birth of Christ, when the overland trade route finally stopped being profitable. 
frankincense that was once carried here by the ships of the desert began instead to be transported by ships at sea. The development of sea trade meant that merchant boats could sail along the length of the Red Sea in around 60 days, more than twice as fast as camels taking the overland route. The Saudi Arabian Coast Guard are granting me extraordinary access to see evidence of this sea trade route for myself. I'm joining Eric Mason, a professional diver who recently discovered an untouched and ancient shipwreck. With 35 years diving experience, he's one of the few with permission to explore Saudi's highly guarded and pristine reefs. So now they've stopped all shore diving. Wow, that's Only brilliant. escorted diving, yeah? Yeah. So they said, if you can't, uh, if you can't respect the reef, then stay off it. So wow. it's good for That's us. That's great. Good for us. That's Conservation. Great. Yeah, yeah great. brilliant. Reliable sea trade started along this coast when a fleet of Roman warships was sent here by Julius Caesar to protect merchants' boats from pirates. Soon, even the smallest of privately owned boats were able to make safe passage and everything from cinnamon to pepper and, of course, frankincense sailed north towards the Roman Empire. We're heading 30 nautical miles offshore to explore what Eric thinks is one of many ancient merchant shipwrecks along the route. He discovered it by chance. Purely accident. We yeah. sheltered behind, the same as the captain of the shipwreck did. Yeah. We came behind the reef in the storm. Yeah. And uh, we were messing around looking for something to eat. Two hours offshore, we see waves breaking on a reef. Eric thinks the ancient merchant ship was sailing north when it hit this reef and sank. The remains of it still lie on the seabed. The Saudi Coast Guard have given me permission to dive with Eric, but only according to their rules. Unsurprisingly, I'm forbidden from bringing anything to the surface and also from revealing the precise location of the wreck. Well, I have to say, diving in Saudi was not something I expected to be able to do it's actually on the not something route. many people have done. I know, I'm so excited about yeah, it. Yeah, you should be, yeah. Eric, to tie it up with our incense route to, you know, something that you think of as being purely over land, but of course, yeah. it was the sea that took over. It really did. And it see destroyed the land routes, in fact. Yeah. yeah, and to see evidence of that is going to be amazing. No question. <laughs> Simply because it hasn't been dived, people haven't been coming here. So we've been blessed. We've been blessed by paranoia. OK. OK. Tack open? Yep. Thank you. Why not? <laughs> this is Saudi Arabia. Please remember where you are. I know. Are you okay? I am. <laughs> 